Consumer Insurance Disclosure and Representations Bill Lords, no. not amended in the Public Bill Committee to be considered. No. <laughs> We now come to first to new clause one. Mr. Christopher Leslie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And it's um, uh, fortunate that we have the opportunity to uh, be actually debating this bill at report and uh, third reading uh, stage today on the floor of the House. The, um, uh, well, for a number of reasons. First of all, the finance, uh, financial services um, bill committee stage is currently. Uh, underway upstairs in the committee corridor in uh, uh, committee room 12, uh, where the minister who would normally uh, be taking these particular issues is uh, answering uh, those, those debates and uh, addressing many of the amendments that uh, I have tabled along with uh, my honourable friends. And it's a shame that um, uh, for some reason the government saw fit to only put one minister uh, on that particular committee, which meant that the minister responsible was unable to join us today. But I've popped down. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, to and what a pleasure it is to see the Honourable Lady uh, fielding this particular bill on uh, his behalf, and um, uh, I'll have a number of questions for her on, on some of the uh, detail. It's also fortunate that we're debating this uh, bill at report stage on the floor of the House because, rather bizarrely, uh, this is a piece of legislation uh, that um, the government chose to take uh, on its second reading upstairs in a committee. Now, I didn't know, um, Mr Speaker, that uh, bills such as these could have a second reading and uh, debate up, in, up on the um, uh, committee corridor, but apparently, under one of the uh, more arcane standing orders of the House, law commission bills are uh, able to have their second reading um, upstairs in a committee. They would never normally see... Uh, discussion on the floor of the House. Uh, now, um, I personally don't believe that a piece of legislation, if it's uh, primary legislation, should not have a hearing on the floor of the House. I think it's a very important uh, principle. And uh, despite my objections at the time, we had that second reading upstairs. So I challenged the Minister, uh, can we have the report stage on the floor of the House? And eventually he uh, relented under extreme pressure, I have to uh, tell the Minister. Um, uh, I regard that as probably one of the greatest uh, triumphs that I've managed to secure whilst in opposition. Um, although, actually, uh, it, it turns out that apparently the report stage could also have been taken uh, at, a, at a committee. So this primary piece of legislation need never, ever have seen uh, the floor of the House of Commons. Anyway, I, I digress, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I'm just saying how fortunate we all are to have the opportunity to be debating the Consumer Insurance Brackets Disclosure and Representation Bill uh, that is before us today. And I have to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that it is a broadly positive bill. And I want to place on record my own thanks to uh, the Law Commission and indeed the Scottish Law Commission, who uh, during the uh, period uh, when the previous administration was in office in 2009, uh, published a joint report entitled the Consumer Insurance Law uh, Pre-Contract Disclosure and Misrepresentations uh, Report, uh, which uh, has resulted in this particular piece of legislation coming forward. The new clause that I am moving today on, on report stage uh, is fairly simple and I hope um, relatively uh, uncontroversial, something which I hope the government might actually accept as a, a positive step forward. And the new clause uh, simply says that the Treasury shall, within one year of commencement of this Act, publish a review of the impact of the Act on the availability and the cost of consumer insurance. Now, um, the many honourable members who are here joining us in this debate uh, today will know that consumer insurance is incredibly important to all of our constituents. Uh, we're talking about uh, not just sort of life insurance uh, issues that uh, sometimes uh, uh, members of the public might, might want to uh, take out, but of course the more day-to-day -day household uh, contents insurance, building insurance, motor insurance, uh, flood risk insurance, um, uh, personal effects insurance, and even, I suppose, pet insurance, uh, health insurance. There are a number of insurance schemes that uh, maybe the Honourable Lady has taken out over the years. My honourable friend may have done uh, similarly. Um, so consumer insurance is incredibly important. And while the legislation before us today may superficially look to be only changing um, small aspects of those contractual um, uh, issues, 
uh, they nevertheless give us the opportunity to take stock of the state of the consumer insurance market and to ask some questions about you know, where is that market heading, particularly in the light of the provisions in this uh, bill. The, the bill, I think, has a number of uh, important uh, purposes to it, and I, I, I'll, I will obviously touch on in third reading later on uh, the important aspects of, of the bill. But essentially, the story uh, goes back to the 18th and the 19th uh, centuries, uh, when uh, a, a, a degree of co uh, common law had accrued uh, about uh, those questions governing uh, a new contract for insurance. And uh, it was felt in uh, 1906 that uh, the Marine Insurance Act needed to be placed on the uh, statute book. I know the, see, the Honourable Gentleman has recalled it from his uh, history studies. Um, uh, strictly speaking, although that act only applies to marine insurance, uh, since that time it's been taken and generally understood that the provisions in that particular act, uh, although they relate uh, solely to those uh, marine uh, uh, insurance arrangements, are to be taken as understood to apply to all forms of uh, insurance, and essentially they are the building blocks of the contractual uh, process involved in, in that consumer insurance uh, uh, trade. Of course I'll give way. Um, I'm extremely grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Uh, he will know uh, that the wonderful piece of drafting of the 1906 Act by uh, Sir Mackenzie Dial uh, uh, Chambers was, um, is something that uh, many insurance lawyers um, commend to the House as a wonderful piece of, of, of drafting. Uh, and I should, I suppose, on this first occasion of intervention in this debate, uh, refer the House to my own entry in the Register of Members' Financial Interests as uh, an insurance practitioner. But I wonder uh, whether he thinks that it is a good idea for Parliament to intervene in this way, given that there are certain respects in which the 1906 Act alters the common law, for example, in relation to the test of loss, at least in relation to marine insurance, where the test of loss now differs from the test of loss in relation to non-marine insurance. Very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for uh, him, him taking the time to bring his experience to bear on this particular uh, debate. It's incredibly uh, useful. I suppose, to a certain extent, we all ought to declare an interest in these arrangements as consumers ourselves. We may well have some of our arrangements uh, affected. And he's right. That particular piece of legislation back in 1906 has certainly stood uh, the test of time for a considerable period, more than a, uh, a century. Um, uh, I can't, uh, I have to confess, I haven't uh, got a copy of the Act in, in front of me today, but essentially paraphrasing those ar arrangements, uh, they, they uh, did enshrine certain pr principles of, of disclosure. Uh, but in particular, they placed a considerable emphasis on the um, contracting uh, party, the, the, the party seeking insurance, to uh, generally disclose any issues that might be broadly relevant in the insurance uh, process. And the insurer uh, didn't have to, wasn't required to uh, ask a series of very specific uh, questions about the particulars of the, of the individual um, being insured. The, it was something left very much uh, to the discretion of the insurer. It was part of contract law in that, in that sense. And of course, common law has accrued around those uh, since that time. But there have been uh, some serious problems that have uh, developed in recent decades about the, the, where, the, where the balance is struck between insurer and the person uh, being insured and the onus that falls perhaps too heavily on the person being insured. Uh, for example, if um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, you have taken out a uh, uh, ha household contents insurance recently, I'm, I'm not sure whether you, you have, I'd suggest that you you do. It's a wise thing to a wise thing to do, but it can be quite expensive, and uh, it may be that you will have been asked a, a number of, uh, of questions about the type of mortise lock or whatever it happens to be uh, in your particular uh, place of residence. Um, but there may be circumstances where, because you didn't volunteer uh, particular data about. Um, the, the, the nature of, your, of the building in which you reside or uh, how, f how frequently you are, you are away on business or so, forth, so on and so forth, that uh, an insurer, if they had a beady eye to, the, uh, to, to wishing to 
a, a, a void an obligation to pay up uh, should you be unfortunate enough to be to be burgled or or um, uh, be in need of making a claim then uh, your insurance could be invalidated perhaps unwittingly through no uh, fault of your own, other than your failure to disclose a number of unspecified uh, uh, issues uh, to the insurance. So this has caused a number of problems for individuals up and down the country uh, for, to consumers for, for a, a long period of time. Great frustration, a sense of mistrust sometimes between uh, those insurance companies and those parties uh, seeking to be insured. And so um, I'm, I welcome the bill uh, brought forward as it is with a large dollop of cross-party support because hopefully this will clarify the issue uh, move on, albeit from the uh, finely drafted 1906 provisions, and put on the uh, in statute a clear um, and, and simple uh, set of rules to update the law relating to pre-contractual disclosure, uh, as well as addressing issues to do with misrepresentations that can sometimes uh, be made deliberately, but are often made unwittingly. And it's important that some of the accretions of case law guidance, voluntary codes that have accrued over the, over the years uh, can be now uh, superseded by a statute law as we have it. Now, the reason I think it's important that we have the opportunity to review the Act uh, one year from, from its commencement uh, is, uh, well, for a start, to test the good faith uh, that many consumer bodies have placed in the importance of this particular legislation. There are, there are many organisations who have written in support of the uh, proposals we have uh, before us today. Uh, that is a very good thing. Uh, I think they've done a fantastic job in scrutinising the development of this particular legislation uh, by the Law Commission. Uh, but I think in order to, uh, to, be, to assure those consumer bodies that in fact this is the right thing to put on the statute book. A simple commitment to make a review after a year wouldn't be especially onerous um, uh, for a number of reasons as we're, as we're, as we're testing today. For instance, um, the regulatory impact assessment in the uh, legislation, I think uh, in paragraph uh, 17, talks about um, a number of additional uh, claim payments that might result uh, uh, because of the tightening up of uh, disclosure provisions that the bill uh, puts in place. Now, uh, those uh, are sort of fractional uh, very much in, in terms of uh, those extra payments, but it'd be interesting to see whether, in fact, consumers do uh, receive payouts more frequently uh, as a result of the specificity and the, and the particularity that, that we're putting on, onto the, uh, on, within those insurance uh, contracts. Um, there are uh, also, in my view, uh, different types of uh, insurance market which we can't simply lump together as though uh, they're all affected equally by the bill that we have today. Certain insurance contracts are very much related uh, to uh, the business sector, but they're covered by other pieces of legislation in, in different parts of the world. But when it comes to insu consumer insurance, uh, there are certain uh, contracts that some may regard as discretionary, luxury insurance in, in some respects, the, the sort of thing that it would be desirable to have but not essential for uh, daily life. Now, the Honourable Member, uh, uh, f the whip for the government may have uh, a, a pet animal, a, c a cat or a dog. I'm not sure whether he does. He, a llama. He has a llama. Uh, I, did, I did not know that, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure I needed to know it either. But the, 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 uh, the, the government whip may well uh, choose to take out insurance uh, on his pet llama. Um, <laughs> uh, where is this going? You might ask yourself, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The key, the key, uh, the key, the key question, therefore, is: Is that a discretionary? Uh, would that be a luxury insurance product, or does he have such an affection for that pet llama that he and he says he does from a sedentary position that he feels it is an absolute necessity to always ensure that that llama has pet insurance? Um, uh, now, if it is a necessity for him. He will find that under this Act, uh, rather than uh, simply taking out a, uh, a, an insurance contract under generic terms, he may well be asked a series of very specific questions about his pet llama. Uh, they could range uh, from how long he has kept that llama, 
Uh, they could uh, talk about the age of that particular llama, the, the, the environment in which it is, in which it is kept. And uh, he, may, he may well think, well, this insurance uh, could become quite expensive if, if my circumstances don't particularly fit uh, the arrangement. But he, you know, he may well feel, you know, the, of all the insurance products that I want to take out, well, this is something I'll just leave. I'll take a, take a risk. Poor old llama uh, may well just have to take its, uh, take its chances. But in other circumstances... Of course I will, yes. Well, the honourable gentleman frightens my honourable friend yeah, 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 from yeah, yeah, actually yeah, yeah. insuring the llama. Might I just point out, since my, uh, my honourable and uh, learned friend uh, referred to his own interests, that I was a former director of the NFU Mutual Insurance Company, and I can tell you that that farming insurance company would find no difficulty whatsoever in providing insurance for a llama. Yeah. I'm, I, think, I think a deal has been transacted uh, on the floor of the House, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I have to say, under the provisions of this bill, a series of uh, disclosure requirements uh, may be, may be uh, requested from honourable members seeking, uh, seeking that insurance. And my point is simply this. We need to know the impact of this bill on pet insurance and on those discretionary areas, um, but also, of course, perhaps more importantly, on those essential elements of personal insurance that we as, as members of parliament would all want our constituents to have. So, for example, household insurance, uh, uh, flood risk insurance, um, motor insurance, those are things where there's perhaps less uh, wiggle room for individuals to decide, well, I'm not going to uh, go with it. Now, there are separate discussions to be had about, um, in, in another place, about uh, whether certain drivers um, sometimes think, well, the fine that I get for driving uninsured is less than the actual cost of the motor insurance itself and so I'll just take my chances and drive on an uninsured basis and I really think that is a serious point that we have to come back to because in my view the penalty for driving uninsured needs to be higher than the cost of getting the insurance in the first place. Pretty straightforward point Mr Deputy Speaker but you'd be surprised at the small level of fines that can sometimes be issued to people who drive uninsured and I'm sh quite sh sure uh, that my honourable uh, friends and honourable friends opposite, honourable colleagues opposite will know of, uh, know of circumstances uh, where constituents have been uh, unfortunately involved in accidents from uninsured drivers who then go on to be prosecuted. They find that the fines perhaps are, uh, are a pittance and you know, it sends a message that says, well, why bother with insurance? But I think we, so we, I think we do have to come back to that. Um, but you know, that's a moot point whether that would be the sort of thing that would fall under the, the, the new clause that we're debating uh, today. But I think that mandatory insurance, insurances are particularly important when it comes to this particular piece of legislation because I can foresee circumstances where, uh, with car insurance in particular, um, the insurance sector uh, feels that um, there isn't much return uh, for many of, the, many of them uh, when it comes to motor insurance. And although many of our constituents will be howling sometimes with uh, derision at the sheer expense and cost of motor insurance, uh, which I think the ABI, the, the AA uh, recently said uh, rose by around 16.4% in, in 2011. Uh, the uh, the um, uh, bill will make provision uh, about the disclosure of certain uh, extra aspects of information for those uh, who have no choice but to take out motor insurance if they want to drive. This is a legal requirement in this country. It's not something people can choose uh, whether to have or not. And so they'll be surprised that even though these costs are ballooning and escalating, something which I think... Uh, needs to be uh, tackled very seriously in a number of different ways. Um, th the uh, insurance sector uh, say, well, uh, this is an area of work uh, which isn't massively profitable for them. The Association of British Insurers, for instance, have described motor insurance as one of the most challenging products for insurers. Um, there is, a, I think they say premiums were amounted to £10.7 billion, pounds, claims were £10.3 billion, and so often they say the margins are not particularly great. Now, uh, it's difficult for us as, as uh, 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 non-experts in this particular trade to know 
uh, whether insurance companies are making significant profits or not. But let's just take, it, take them at their word that they're not making excessive profits. I can envisage a situation where insurance companies may say, well, actually, we want to back, back out, pardon the pun, of the motor insurance uh, trade. Uh, they may well feel that uh, they, in order to do that, they want to deter new uh, contracts for motor insurance. And uh, one way of doing that might well be to place a series of extra hurdles for customers in order to obtain insurance. Many young drivers, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, will know uh, at their cost how difficult it can sometimes be to get an uh, um, uh, insurance cover for their vehicles. I don't know whether the Honourable Lady has a driving licence uh, herself. She does have a driving licence, and so she will know and I'm glad she's got insurance. I, I would expect nothing less. Certainly the government car, sh car service will have uh, insurance. But, you know, she, she not, not so many years ago, may have found that under the age of 25, uh, it, w it would have been extremely difficult to even find companies that would, that would insure uh, her for that. Of course, she is no doubt a very careful driver uh, with an unblemished uh, record and as a, as a woman driver may find it easier to get insurance but there are many young male drivers who find it incredibly difficult. My point is simply this, we need the ability to review the impact of the Act um, in order to test what's happening in motor insurance and particular to those drivers who already feel as though they, they struggle to get insurance, there may be additional hurdles being placed in their way. Now I don't object to the uh, shift in the balance of disclosure that is set out in the bill, and I just want to put, put that on record. But I think it's also important that we take time to recognise that there could be circumstances where uh, um, uh, those seeking motor insurance find it more difficult as a result. We just don't know. And that's why we need a review to take place a year after the uh, commencement of this particular piece of legislation. The other area where I think I, I want a review to touch upon is in respect of uh, those households who are subject to flood risk. Apparently, and I didn't realise this, Mr Deputy Speaker, until I researched this particular statistic, one in six homes in the United Kingdom are subject to uh, uh, the, the sort of at-risk categorisation of potential uh, flooding. Amounts paid out by insurers since uh, the year 2000 have exceeded four and a half billion. And uh, an article in the journal This Is Money recently said that uh, annual uh, flood damage claims are running at at least above a billion pounds each year. 200,000 homes could become uninsurable uh, by 2013 if an agreement cannot be reached between the government and the industry uh, on uh, high-risk areas. And this is incredibly important to those individuals, whether it's in Hull, where recently they had particular difficulties in gaining insurance uh, or not. Now, for those individuals seeking to take out an insurance uh, contract, uh, this set of changes on disclosure may well affect their ability to do that. Um, they, many, many people may well have taken out flood insurance and found unwittingly that they were not able to receive a payment, even though a catastrophe occurred, a flood, a river burst its bank or banks or whatever it may be, uh, because there were, there were aspects of disclosure that they didn't realise they were supposed to make at the time. And uh, I want to see a review of the Act, of these changes. Hopefully it will improve the situation where um, we uh, find that more people are able to take out um, uh, flood insurance in a way uh, that is um, uh, giving assurance to them and to the insurers that the contract can be fulfilled, that payouts can be made in uh, circumstances uh, of, of uh, flood and, and that sort of uh, eventuality. Uh, but we just really don't know what the impact is going to be. And so um, given that uh, for some flood victims, the costs of their insurance premiums rise uh, you know, 500% after, after they experience a particular issue, if they can get flood insurance at all. Uh, this bill is quite relevant uh, to them, and I think it's very important we have uh, a, a review to see what's going to happen in those particular uh, circumstances. So, um, yes, I think it's important for those discretionary areas of, of insurance uh, that we see what's happening in the market there as a result of this bill, but it's particularly those essential uh, mandatory uh, aspects, the sort of roof over the head type of insurance uh, that I think we need to see 
a uh, review. And, and for those reasons, I think it would be very helpful if the Minister could accept that a review uh, will take place. New Clause 1, Review of the Impact of the Act on Availability and Cost of Consumer Insurance. The question is that the clause be read a second time. Mr Stephen Phillips. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise only to make a short contribution, since it seems to me that um, uh, this proposed amendment to the Bill is misconceived. It's not something that the Law Commission thought was necessary, and I think, um, with the greatest of respect, that the Honourable Gentleman who speaks for the opposition on this has actually undermined his own case uh, because it is only uh, in circumstances uh, where claims which ought to be paid uh, have not been paid that there might be any adverse impact on the costs of the insurance type of the, the types of insurance contracts uh, which this act covers uh, and it is as i have to say to him and indeed to the whole house uh, uh, in these uh, days when, to be fair, there is no one except the Honourable Gentleman and his whip on the opposition benches. But uh, it is, in, in this day and age, I have to say that this, this, I'm pleased to see this bill come before the House. Uh, uh, and it's long, long overdue, and maybe one can speak to that on third reading. But it's certainly the position, uh, as it seems to me, that um, this uh, piece of legislation is not only long overdue, but that it's inconceivable either that it will remove products from the market or indeed that it will add greatly to the costs of the type of insurance contracts which this Act is designed to cover. Uh, and I can't help feeling in those circumstances that this is not an amendment uh, which the Honourable Gentleman will wish to press. Uh, I will, of course, give way. I hear the points that the Honourable Gentleman makes, and I don't wish to in any way denigrate the importance of the, of the bill itself. It's an extremely positive and, and important piece of legislation. But just because it is a law commis commission originating piece of legislation doesn't necessarily make it perfect, nor does it negate the need for a, a review. I don't, I don't think he should be under illusion that just because those fine minds at the law commission introduced this piece of legislation, that it's necessarily something we should, we should not scrutinise. <laughs> suggesting that, that it shouldn't be scrutinised. The difficulty with the amendment uh, which the uh, Honourable Gentleman is moving uh, is that um, uh, if one envisages a situation where an insurance company ought to be paying a claim but has not been paying it, paying it previously uh, as a result of an inadvertent misrepresentation or non-disclosure, everybody uh, in this House and every one of our constituents wishes that position to change, and that's why the bill comes forward. So the only way in which the costs of the types of insurance contract which this bill covers are going to increase is if claims which ought previously to have been paid, that is legitimate claims, are now paid in circumstances where an insurance company, perhaps a disreputable one, although uh, I venture to suggest that there aren't really any of those left in this country, declines to pay a claim on a specious basis. And for that reason, uh, in fact, as it seems to me, the review which the Honourable Gentleman's Amendment uh, proposes is in fact unnecessary. Uh, it's not um, a, a review which I anticipate the government uh, will wish to no. carry out. I'll just finish this point and then I will give way. It's not a review which I suspect uh, the government will wish to carry out. Uh, and for that reason, uh, as it seems to me, uh, the Honourable Gentleman's uh, rather hoist by his own petard because of the argument that he's made in support of the bill as a whole. But I give way to my Honourable Friend. My Honourable Friend. Uh, in the set of circumstances that my Honourable Friend refers to, where there would apparently be a proper claim which for specious grounds is declined by an insurance company, my Honourable and learned friend will know that arrangements are in place for the Financial Ombudsman Service to look at circumstances of that nature. And notwithstanding the 1906 Act, very many times the Financial Ombudsman orders under the Treating Customers Fairly provisions put into operation by the Financial Services Authority that a payment should be made. In fact, that's one of the reasons for this bill, isn't it? Because rather than have the Financial Services Ombudsman being actively involved in righting wrongs, we should be able to do so now through legislation itself. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for the intervention, and it, it is a valid point. Um, the uh, insurance uh, industry has long been uh, regulated, and the Ombudsman has long been able to make declarations, but there are circumstances uh, in which one can't go to the Ombudsman, for example, if the financial value of the contract is too high. There are circumstances in which the Ombudsman will not intervene, for example, if uh, legal proceedings between the consumer and the insurance company, or, or um, uh, if it's Lloyd, some other insurer, uh, are already afoot. And in addition to that, uh, m uh, uh, experience dictates that the Financial Ombudsman is not, for example, 
um, uh, uh, particularly au fait with some of the more obscure uh, parts of insurance law which, which this bill does grapple, uh, such as the, uh, uh, th those parts of the common law which deal with basis clauses and the um, turning of, uh, of representations into warranties when they're made the basis of the contract. And so I hear what my honourable friend says, but um, uh, it is, I think, fair to say that this bill is not only welcome, uh, but that it comes uh, uh, forward with um, proper proposals, which the Law Commission has properly considered, uh, that it requires no review of the type that this amendment contemplates, and that for those reasons this amendment is, uh, in my uh, respectful view, misconceived, and I'm sure that the honourable gentleman won't push it for those reasons. Cho. Mr Deputy Speaker, just to say a few things. Actually, I, I was rather attracted to the Honourable Gentleman from the Nottingham East's uh, new clause uh, because I, I think that the idea that this House should engage in post-legislative scrutiny is a good one. Uh, and I think that that accords with good uh, legislative practice. That's effectively what the Honourable Gentleman is saying. Is that, and he's not saying that this House... Uh, would necessarily be involved in this again. He's saying that the, the Treasury, the, the department that's promoting uh, this bill, that they would have an obligation uh, to uh, assure everybody uh, that, uh, about the impact of the legislation uh, that we'd uh, passed. And uh, I, I can see that this could be a, a very important precedent, and perhaps it would be a precedent uh, that will be part of official opposition policy in due course, that whatever legislation is passed, uh, there should be um, po uh, provision for a uh, post-legislative uh, uh, scrutiny. Th this whole area of, of uh, in insurance is extremely uh, complicated, and as the Honourable Gentleman said, it is uh, very expensive for lots of people. And the reason it's so expensive is because there's an enormous amount of fraud. Uh, and uh, if we didn't have so much fraud, uh, particularly in relation to um, motor accidents, and we've heard uh, recently about the high uh, incidence of uh, claims for a whiplash. Almost everybody who's involved in a most minor bump involved uh, in, in, in their car, uh, then they uh, get encouraged to make a claim on their insurance for a whiplash injury and the insurance companies in invariably end up paying a lot of money um, in order to uh, prevent those what they would describe as nuisance claims uh, going to a full litigation but effectively uh, they are held to ransom and not surprisingly it's the customers of those insurance companies that end up paying uh, the, the bill in, in the form of, of higher premiums and that's particularly pernicious uh, when we are talking about a, a form of insurance which is compulsory. Uh, and uh, that's what, uh, obviously, motor insurance, uh, third-party fire and theft is, is, in, is compulsory for uh, people who are uh, seeking to uh, drive a, a motor vehicle on the road. And it's particularly tough on young people. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's been made tougher in some respects by this ludicrous uh, European uh, legislation which uh, says that uh, the insurance companies can't take account of uh, whether a young girl, for example, has, is likely to belong to a class group uh, that has a, a lower claims uh, rate than a, a young man who who's, belongs to a group which has a higher uh, claims rate and therefore uh, additional costs. And the consequence of all that, Mr Deputy Speaker, as you know, is that uh, the premiums for uh, young women have increased uh, significantly and de de significantly faster than the, the premiums for uh, young uh, men. I, I suppose, I, in a sense, I've got a family interest in this. And my, my daughter has recently acquired her first car and taken out her first uh, insurance policy. And uh, reconfirming, in a sense, what the honourable gentleman was, was saying, uh, the, in, in the end, she uh, bought an insurance policy because she obviously hadn't got any no claims record because she hadn't got any, any driving experience. In the end, the best deal was from a company that was offering her 10 months of uh, insurance, which enables her to get the prospect of uh, being able to get a, a no claims discount after 10 months rather than uh, after, after a year. Uh, but well, if it, yes, of course, um, may well be that there's another purpose in the 10 months, which is that the decision that he refers to in Europe comes into operation in 10 months' time. Oh, well, that may, my, my honourable friend uh, is, is, is ahead of the game on, on this. Um, I, I was interested in his earlier intervention declaring um, his knowledge and experience of uh, one particular I I insurance company. Um, I, I must say that that particular insurance company, which is one that, um, uh, from which we sought to get a quote, 
um, was extremely reluctant uh, to um, even consider um, providing an insurance cover at a reasonable price. The answer was they didn't want to engage in, in, this, in this market and have recently uh, changed their policy. And I think it's a pity that what is effectively a, a mutual insurance, uh, well, what is a, a, a mutual insurance uh, company, has uh, decided that uh, the pressures are such that even for long-standing co uh, customers of the, of the company is not prepared to uh, take on um, at a reasonable price the sort of risks to which I've I've been uh, referring. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's easy, I think, to start going unnecessarily wide on, on, a, on, a, on an issue like this, because all I'm really asking, and perhaps being uh, led, led astray, perhaps by the Honourable Gentleman opposite, because of the, the width with which he introduced his, 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 his new clause. But I look forward to hearing from uh, the, the Minister in response to this idea for having a post-legislative scrutiny, and um, perhaps if she uh, is able to fit it in, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, within the, within the scope of responding to uh, this uh, short debate, she'd be able to uh, discuss whether it would, it would be or might become a government policy to have uh, post-legislative scrutiny as a norm rather than a as an exception. But I hope that she will come forward with some very uh, strong and persuasive arguments uh, so that I don't have to uh, join the Honourable Gentleman opposite in, in, the, in the lobby in support of new clause one. Too wide for, the, for this particular debate, but Chloe Smith. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, may I welcome um, the, the three contributions we've, we've just heard and indeed the, the interventions as well. Uh, first of all, of course, I wholeheartedly welcome the cross-party support that this bill uh, overall has. Uh, I have a, a, a few points to respond to, which I'm sure will make the Honourable Member for Christchurch uh, happy today. Uh, and may I also uh, take the opportunity to thank the Honourable Member for Sleaford for his learned uh, for his uh, uh, very learned and helpful contributions. I I'm afraid on a, on a very brief note of discord, I must just begin, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, by recommending, in fact, a purchase to, to the Honourable Gentleman opposite. He has kindly recommended me motor insurance and my, my uh, Honourable friend Lama insurance. Um, and what I need to recommend to him, I think, is the standing orders of the House of Commons for a, a simple £10, if he can't already find one in the library. Because on page uh, 53, he will find the explanation to his questions around a standing order, a uh, standing, excuse me, a second reading committee in relation to law commission bills, and I, and I commend that reading to him for that. Uh, can, I, uh, can I go on then to, to deal with this bill, uh, this, this uh, amendment, uh, new, excuse me, this new clause in more detail? Firstly, uh, to answer the, the, the question around uh, review, uh, the Honourable Member for Christchurch, as I say, will I think be very pleased to know that the Treasury is already committed to a post-implementation review of this bill in three to five years' time. That will examine whether it has achieved its objectives, this bill, the, the Act, as it, we hope it will then be, identify whether there are any unintended consequences, and assess the costs and benefits of the legislation. What I would then say to the Honourable Gentleman who is pressing uh, perhaps his new clause is to say that that new clause is therefore an unnecessary addition to the bill in the sense that the clause seeks uh, a review. However, it's also unnecessary uh, in the context of this bill in particular to draw our attention to the cost and availability of consumer insurance. And that is because this government is already taking those issues very seriously and I don't think we need a review of this bill to trigger uh, attention to the issues in the sense that we are already taking action upon them. And let me go into, uh, in particular, uh, two of the areas he has, uh, he has named, both motor insurance and flood insurance. To start with, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, you will know, that, as, as others will, that three weeks ago the Prime Minister met with the insurance industry and consumer groups to discuss rising premiums and the steps that uh, we are and, and will be taking to bring those down. Turning firstly to motor insurance then, this government I think has already taken a wide-ranging series of actions to tackle the rising costs of car insurance and we are committed to doing even more. So first of all, we are already proceeding with a series of legal reforms which will reduce the costs associated with personal injury claims. The cost of claims, of course, following motor accidents is a crucial driver of insurance premiums, and we think that under the current system, too many people can profit from minor or spurious accidents at the expense of motorists. We do expect our ban on, refer on refer excuse me, referral fees and a reform of no-win, no-fee agreements to reduce both the level of these fees and the number of uh, frivolous claims. 
We have also then committed to reducing the current uh, £1,200 fee, which lawyers can earn from small value personal injury claims. And in return, insurance have committed that these savings will be passed directly to policyholders, which I am sure all honourable members here today welcome. There is still more, however, we can do to reduce the unnecessary costs of personal injury. According to the ABI, one, uh, one in every 140 people claims compensation for whiplash every year in the UK. This is many more claims than in 2008, when these claims cost £2 billion. This adds a substantial cost to premiums, and we are now working to identify effective ways to reduce uh, both the number and the cost of these claims. So the options include improved medical evidence, Mr Deputy Speaker, technological breakthroughs, the threshold for claims, and also the speed of accidents. Progress on this will be made in the coming months, and again, as I say, we are taking steps now, thus uh, uh, negating, in my opinion, the need for, uh, for writing this into the Bill. While these steps uh, will re help to reduce costs for all motorists, we are aware of the particular difficulties for young drivers. I shan't uh, uh, perhaps uh, gratify the Honourable Member opposite by putting my own uh, age on the record. He, he may know it from elsewhere. But we, we do recognise that the cost of insurance uh, can be prohibitive for some of those facing premiums in the thousands of pounds and the effects that this can have on employment prospects, actually, quite, uh, quite importantly. So at the Prime Minister's summit, Mr Deputy Speaker, Government and the insurance industry committed to working together to look at what more can be done regarding young drivers' risks and safety. One key prospect for improving affordability for this group could be the wider use of uh, telematics or smart box technology, and I have no doubt that uh, Miss Chope may be one of the uh, early adopters. Uh, we never know of, of such, such, uh, such driving behaviour. But, but this technology um, gives young drivers the chance of affordable car insurance by adopting safer driving. Turning, Mr Deputy Speaker, to flood insurance before uh, uh, swiftly wrapping up uh, on this, uh, this, this proposed new clause. There will, I'm sure, be particular interest in this across the House, in particular, of course, for those households, constituents of ours who are, who, who are or may be at high risk of flooding. Domestic insurance covering flood is currently widely available, even within areas at significant flood risk, at similar prices to elsewhere. Around 80% of households at significant risk who purchase insurance do not, however, pay a price that reflects their flood risk. They are actually subsidised by those at lower risk, paying higher premium. So the government has an, an agreement, therefore, with the insurance industry, known as the Statement of Principles, which commits insurers to offer cover to properties at significant flood risk, where there are plans in place to reduce that risk within five years. The agreement is due to end uh, on the 30th of June 2013, and insurers refuse to renew it on the basis that it distorts the market. More crucially, there is a continuing market trend for insurers' pricing to be more risk-reflective as better information on flood risk becomes available. In the absence of intervention, Mr Deputy Speaker, insurance may become more costly or, in a small number of cases, unavailable for some customers at high flood risk. The current statement of principles says nothing about the price of cover and therefore does nothing for those households which might face premium increases. We continue to work, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the theme of us taking action already. We continue to work with insurance companies to consider measures which might help safeguard the affordability of flood insurance for households. So as part of this ongoing work, we will be considering the feasibility, the value for money and indeed the deliverability of targeting funds to help those most in need. This includes models suggested by the ABI, which uh, involves subsidisation of insurance premiums. We have committed to providing details in the spring. And this will give insurers certainty more than a year in advance of the expiry of the current agreement. Of course, the priority will then continue to be to invest in reducing the risk of flooding in the first place. Action to reduce flood risk itself plays a, a vital role in bearing down on insurance costs. The government is uh, investing £2.17 billion on flood and coastal erosion risk management in the period up to March 2015, which provides better protection to over 145,000 homes. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, the Government continues to take very seriously indeed the impacts of the availability and the affordability of consumer insurance. I have given two examples here, motoring and flooding. This addition, which seeks to very broadly add uh, to the Bill, is therefore not necessary, Mr Deputy Speaker, to ensure that consideration is given to those issues, and I would, uh, I would uh, ask the Honourable Member opposite to withdraw his amendment. Mr Leslie. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I'm grateful to the Minister uh, and indeed other honourable members for uh, taking the time to reflect on the particular uh, new clause that I've tabled. I don't uh, 
think that it would be particularly onerous. I think it's quite important uh, that we have the opportunity to test the impact of the bill, which is quite significant in some of the changes that it's making to the, to the contractual uh, process, albeit uh, welcome uh, changes. And um, uh, in the new spirit of um, accord that I find myself so frequently with the uh, Honourable Member for Christchurch, um, well, particularly in his recent comments in respect of uh, the government's ridiculous plans on child benefit, um, I'm quite uh, taken by his uh, suggestion uh, in respect of post-legislative scrutiny. I think it would be a useful uh, uh, initiative to take to make sure that we did properly review certain uh, provisions in statute and I think that's why in many ways this, this new cause has been uh, suggested. Um, you know, the, the Minister has been very helpful in setting out uh, the government's view in respect of those particular areas where I wanted a review to focus. Motor insurance, she believes that the government are taking uh, steps uh, to deal with some of these difficulties. I have to say I, I disagree. I think there, there aren't enough uh, measures being taken to help those consumers who find that market particularly difficult. Uh, and you know, the cuts in the flood defence budget are also uh, uh, raising the prospect of householders uh, finding themselves uh, flooded uh, more frequently, and that's something that many uh, constituents of honourable uh, members uh, will be uh, concerned about. But um, I do understand uh, the uh, commitment of, of the government to generally keep an eye on this particular issue. Uh, the Minister implies that um, it's not necessary to write it on the face of the bill that we have this particular uh, provision. Um, I think it's a shame she wasn't able to accept it, but uh, given that we've at least had the chance to air it and on the floor of the House of Commons, despite the uh, ridiculous provisions of the standing orders of the House, uh, I'm more than happy to um, withdraw the amendment at, at this time because obviously we don't want to dwell on it uh, for, for too long, but I think the point has been made. Your pleasure that new clause one be withdrawn. Aye. New clause one withdrawn. We now come to amendment one. Mr Leslie. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, if um, honourable members uh, look at the uh, face of the bill at, um, at page 1, uh, line uh, 22, right at the foot of the, of the bill, there is a, a simple uh, provision which states uh, it is the duty of the consumer to take reasonable care not to make a misrepresentation on the insurer. This follows a, a provision, uh, really, which is one of the most important provisions in the bill in Clause 2, uh, that uh, uh, talk about the disclosure and uh, representations that consumers uh, need to make to insurers before a contract is entered into or varied. Now, in the committee stage of the bill, I tabled a, an amendment uh, uh, it, that is specifically uh, to, designed to challenge um, the question of the burden that might uh, fall upon a consumer uh, under the new provisions in this particular legislation. Um, I support the legislation. I think it's very important. I, I want more clarity and disclosure. That, that contractual arrangement needs to be clearer and more transparent. But I, there, is a, there is a slight uh, alarm bell that I have going off in the back of my mind, a, a minor anxiety that I have that we might unwittingly find ourselves in circumstances uh, where uh, an individual uh, faced with a barrage of extra questions that they may be uh, required to answer, perhaps a series of pages, a page after page of forms that they need to fill in that perhaps they didn't have to fill in before, may well take the view, well, I can't, I can't be bothered with this particular insurance cover, uh, especially if it's a sort of discretionary or they feel it's a discretionary area of color, cover. It's not a mandatory area, for instance, in, in car insurance. And, and faced with that weight of administrative bureaucracy, uh, those individuals say, I just don't have the time, the inclination to answer all these dozens and dozens of questions, and uh, therefore they perhaps go without insurance cover when that would not be a prudent or wise thing to do. Most of us uh, would, if in our surgeries, uh, talking to our constituents and they said, should I take out household insurance cover, should I take out contents, uh, buildings insurance and so forth, you say, well, absolutely, you should. You don't know what's around the corner. There could be any number of uh, uh, things that fate could uh, bring and, and uh, bring upon your, your shoulders and therefore you really ought to regard this as essential. And currently, you know, in, in the 
dreadful economic circumstances that this government are presiding over, many uh, people, hard-pressed uh, families, may think, well, certain things have to give. Um, and the costs of insurance, I'm quite sure, are on the minds of many uh, people. But if you add to the uh, question of the, the price of insurance, the onerous, uh, the sense that there is some level of more onerous process, uh, the hoops that they have to jump through in order to fill in the forms, in order to get that insurance, then it may, there may be a certain category of person where a tipping point is, is reached. It might be the straw that breaks the camel's back and they say, I, just, I really just don't think uh, this insurance cover this year is something I can be bothered filling in. And we've all, we've all been there, well, many honourable members may well have been there, where they, where they think that, they, that they, they open the box on a particular product, they think, well, this looks quite interesting, I really must do that. Put a, put a little note in the diary, and then when, you, when you're faced with the hurdles involved in filling out the forms or getting involved in the bureaucracy, it just is something that, that uh, perhaps falls down the, the list of priorities and things to do. And that's the particular point I wanted to test with the amendment we've got here. Now, in committee stage, I think I framed the amendment incorrectly, because the amendment that I tabled at that point was in relation to circumstances where a, a consumer varies a contract that they might have already taken out. So, for instance, the Honourable Lady will know that when she uh, reapplies for her car insurance, um, the insurer will already have a number of particulars of her address and details, her driving habits and so forth, already on record. And so actually renewing an insurance uh, contract may not necessarily be that onerous because the questions don't have to be all asked afresh. She can tick a box and essentially re-answer those questions again. And so uh, at, the, at the time the, the minister uh, explained that wasn't necessary, there are ways, uh, variations of contracts can be done quite efficiently. So I've tried to reframe this amendment now to particularly relate to new insurance contracts, fresh insurance contracts where an individual perhaps uh, who hasn't been a driver before, perhaps who hasn't owned a house before, thinks, right, I'll start it from scratch, I'll get this particular insurance contract. And the, the way I framed the amendment, and I hope honourable members will forgive me for the uh, slightly flowery legislative language that's sometimes used in these provisions, but I've, I've said, uh, I've suggested that the bill should, should have a new subclause added, which states that it's the duty of the insurer to show regard to the principle that a burden or restriction which is imposed on a consumer through requests for particulars before a contract is entered into should be proportionate to the benefits, considered in general terms, which are expected to result from the imposition of that burden or restriction. Now, I know that many honourable members, um, members uh, even from the governing party, have concerns about regulatory burdens generally. And we have to be careful because sometimes regulations are necessary for the protection of individuals, for the protection of society at large. But we, we should always keep a watchful eye on the burdens of those regulations. My own view is that um, when you look at the regulatory impact assessment for this piece of legislation, the actual costs that are falling on the consumers are not especially onerous. And that's why I, I support the bill in general terms. In, in, in pounds, shillings and pence terms, they're pretty negligible. I think the, the re regulatory impact assessment says an additional uh, £700,000 per year will be saved by the insurance sector as a result of the provisions in the bill. If there is an extra charge on consumers, it will probably be two or three pence for every £100 of insurance. So the actual cost issue isn't the thing that I'm concerned about in terms of the burden. The burden that I'm trying to flag up, potentially, is the administrative burden, the non-financial burden that might fall on the shoulders of, of uh, consumers. Yes, I'll give way. Oh, uh, to the uh, Shadow Minister for giving way. Um, who does um, the um, honourable gentleman think will be responsible uh, for determining whether or not this new duty that this amendment seeks to impose uh, will have been fulfilled or not? Well, ultimately, uh, the courts would have to be arbiters in, in these particular arrangements. This is the sort of thing which uh, tends to get drawn into uh, uh, some sort of uh, judicial review arrangements, but I hope, I hope it's not the sort of thing that would need to be tested. It's simply a principle that I would like insurers to have regard to in uh, the um, in, in the way in which they frame their questions the tests 
the requirements for disclosure that they place on the, on the shoulders of the consumer. Because um, the insurers are being uh, made under this legislation to ask more specific questions, much more specific than, than have been uh, the case before. Um, and it's, and it's the, the person who finds form filling particularly difficult or onerous and who thinks, well, I, I just can't be bothered uh, with this particular process. That's the sort of person I'm, I'm worried about in these circumstances. You know, we, we, this isn't necessarily an issue about literacy levels uh, or people's, you know, boredom threshold or propensity to fill in forms, but these are the sorts of questions that are quite material to this particular, uh, this particular piece of legislation. Yes? So in reality... Uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful to the honourable gentleman for giving me away. But in reality, um, the only way that a consumer uh, could enforce this would be to take it to court, and otherwise, he's relying on the good nature of the insurance company. Well, well the, indeed, that is the, the, the very nature of this particular legislation. But I think it's, it, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and frame the duties that insurers have to abide by in the course of uh, changing these disclosure uh, requirements. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know whether um, honourable members opposite have recently uh, visited, I don't know, moneysupermarket.com, confused.com, there's another one of those aggregator uh, websites uh, where a number of insurance companies all come along together and they uh, share a number of uh, questions, uh, the, the hurdles that people have to, uh, have to go through in order to get to the yes process. This is, this is the range of insurance contracts that are available. Uh, and quite honestly, I think the way that aggregator companies deal with this particular bill is, a, is a, in a sense, another question. But, you know, 10 pages are on, 15 pages on, 20 pages on filling the forms. I challenge any honourable member to say that their uh, boredom threshold isn't uh, perhaps uh, raised to some degree. Although I have to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, many honourable members, particularly in the Chamber today, have very, very high uh, boredom thresholds. I know this from experience of many hours of debate, but notwithstanding their um, propensity to sit through quite long and technical discussions, form filling is quite a different uh, matter. And it's really just that, that particular point. It's the administrative burden. It's the question about um, new contracts. I just want to, us to make sure we have an eye to protect that section of society because I can envisage us all seeing constituents in several years to come who come to us in a surgery and say, uh, but Mr. Leslie, Mr. Fabricant, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I cannot get. I, I didn't. I didn't get that insurance. Not because I couldn't afford it, but I just the, 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 the form filling was too much. The questions were just too many. I regret it, but I wish I had. And so um, I uh, uh, would like to ask the minister about that particular uh, point. Uh, she'll understand why I've tabled the amendment in this particular way. It's a very important provision, and I'd be grateful if she would address it. The question is that the amendment be made. Uh, Christopher Chope. Uh, uh, briefly, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I say that again, I think that uh, the Honourable Gentleman has done the House of Service in raising this as, a, as an issue. Um, basically, he's talking about uh, the need for um, some proportionality. I must say on this occasion, I, I do, um, I think, have some disagreement with him about the way he's, he's worded uh, this, because I think it's rather hard in law to uh, put a duty on an insurer to show regard to. I think that that's, um, and in particular, if that's regard to a, a principle and then all the other qualifications, I think it would be very much uh, unenforceable uh, in, in practice. Um, well, I'm away. Of course I will. Uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Um, isn't the honourable gentleman opposite making heavy weather of this? W won't the marketplace take care of this? If one insurer uh, on its own starts to ask ream after ream of uh, questions which other insurers don't ask, surely the potential customer will just go elsewhere. Yeah. Well, my, my right honourable friend has so often anticipated what was going to be my next point, uh, which was that this is something that should be sorted out uh, and will be sorted out uh, in, in the marketplace. Um, the, a new company, perhaps uh, with my, my honourable friend uh, from uh, South Wales as a director, uh, maybe a form called Sim Simple, Simple Insurance or something like that. If there isn't such a company already existing and, 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 that, co and that company uh, will um, promote itself on the basis that the, the questions it asks are, are easy easily answered and there are not too many of them and it's, it's not too uh, burdensome. So I, I, I agree with my, my, my right honourable friend that I think 
that that is a, a, a better way uh, to uh, deal with this. But I think nevertheless that the, the point underlying the, the Honourable Gentleman's uh, uh, bringing before the House uh, this Amendment 1, uh, that a lot of these forms are far too complicated, they're intimidating, so much so that people um, say, well, uh, um, tick all the boxes and they don't really look at the small print. Uh, and uh, I think that's where a lot of people mm. get into mm. uh, difficulties. And of course, uh, often these forms are now not filled in by the person themselves, but they're filled in um, by somebody on the end of a telephone, uh, which again uh, can lead to uh, difficulties, sometimes language uh, difficulties or, or understanding. And I don't think it's just my, my hearing, Mr Deputy Speaker, that causes me sometimes to uh, find it difficult to understand uh, what some of these um, uh, what people are saying on the other end of a, of a phone when they're seeking uh, information. So I, I think that there are some imp important uh, issues here, but I don't think um, that uh, this particular, or the way that this has been e expressed, is the right solution to the problem that the Honourable Gentleman draws attention to. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, I, I'll just answer a few <coughs> of the questions. Uh, laid out here. Uh, in, in the context of this amendment, Mr. Speaker, I am uh, indeed with the with the right honourable member with the honourable member for uh, Christchurch on uh, or, uh, and, and the honourable member for East Yorkshire um, on the on the, the need that the on the idea that the market will uh, assist us um, in this area, and it's on that basis principally that I'm going to to try to deal with with this amendment. The proposed amendment, uh, as uh, honourable members will have seen, seeks to create a duty for insurers to make disclosure requests which are proportionate to the benefits generated. We are also returning to the issue today following discussion during committee stage, and I do hope I'll be able to add to the debate had there uh, by uh, my, co my, my colleague, the uh, Financial Secretary. There is absolutely no disagreement, I think, with the principle that the burdens on consumers should be as light as possible. For the group uh, of consumers that the Honourable uh, Gentleman from Nottingham East has uh, laid out, and, uh, and indeed all those others who wish to, wish to purchase insurance. But I think, actually, as this amendment rightly recognises, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a balance to strike between burden and benefit. Uh, and the government has set out what we, uh, th that we believe this balance is struck by the bill uh, as it stands with commercial pressures as a, uh, as a factor in that case. I'll recap these points shortly, but if, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I'd also like to just set out some background on the types of questions currently asked, which I know members were interested in at committee stage and requested uh, that, that, were, uh, uh, requested that, were, that were brought back to, uh, to the House. In, in particular, about the number of questions asked on average when consumers enter into different types of insurance policy. I was only able to take a very rough look at such things, but if you were to look at some current policies, you would see that it, uh, it, it can take around 13 to 18 questions to underwrite home insurance and around 12 to 18 to underwrite motor insur insurance. I think requirements linked to these fairly straightforward mass market products don't, on this, on this very rough measure, appear to be excessive, uh, but simply counting questions, I think, does rather miss the point. And that is, if insurers only asked a single question, this would actually be far more burdensome for consumers. I think it is much easier to answer a series of short, targeted questions, indeed they must be specific and clear as set out in this bill, rather than to answer a single, very general question like, has anything changed or is there anything I need to know? The Law Commission did undertake a more sophisticated analysis of burdens on consumers, which was contained in their first discussion paper and has informed the development of this bill. They did discover real problems in 2007 with questions being asked in life and critical illness insurance. If I gave an example, one insurer asked, have you had any physical uh, defect or infirmity or is there any ailment or disease from which you suffer or have suffered or to which you have a tendency? This does seem impossibly difficult to answer and would appear to require the consumer to begin at birth and work through every single visit to the doctor, but yet uh, may qualify as proportionate perhaps under this amendment because it is only one question. Reassuringly, I think since 2007 there have been moves within the sector to improve questions and I think the design of this bill means we can expect that this piece of work will further promote this. It is also just briefly worth explaining that, uh, and indeed noting I think the Honourable uh, uh, Member opposite referred to this earlier on, that different, consum different consumers do face, uh, may face a different set of questions in order to purchase a similar policy by virtue of the channel that they choose, whether it be through 
an aggregator or whether it be by the telephone or whether it be uh, face to face in a broker's office. So there is a, um, I think there is a need for uh, insurers to tailor the requests they make in all these ways. Turning actually now to the burdens that may be placed on consumers, this is the nub of this question. I think there is evidence that insurers already pay very careful attention to the burdens they place on consumers. It's already been argued by others here tonight that this is partly driven by market pressure. And let me add uh, to those arguments. Clearly, a consumer has the choice to purchase from an alternative provider if disclosure burdens are too high. And indeed, some insurers have already advertised products on the basis that they are easy to purchase. Comparison sites consistently study these drop-off rates as well and try to make the process as easy as possible. It strikes me that... Uh, it strikes me that no business wishes to run the risk of losing a customer entirely. This, you know, the scare scenario that the honourable gentleman is trying to set out here. No business would wish to do that because that represents a loss of a customer. And indeed, we hope that no consumer would wish to be in that position because they then don't get the security of the product they are, they are looking for, of course, themselves. So there, is, there are savings, of course, to be made for insurers who get the right balance between getting the information they need and then making it easy for consumers to purchase their product. The cost of asking another question is not insignificant, and insurers, I think, are well aware of it when they design their questionnaires. I could refer the House to a, a Price Waterhouse Coopers report in November 2007, which considered uh, the financial impact of the Law Commission's insurance project as a whole. And they recommended, excuse me, they estimated that increasing underwriting by two to three minutes per policy would equate up to an extra £3,600 per £1 million of gross written premiums. That is equivalent to around an extra £150 million spent in the UK general insurance market alone. And this doesn't even include the, costs, uh, the other costs of asking more questions, such as gathering and processing the data. So it is clear, I think, that there is a strong existing incentive for insurers to ensure proportionality. Turning very briefly then to other, prov other provisions in this bill, in case members don't already find market pressures uh, uh, compelling enough to rely upon tonight. There are two further features of this bill which mean that if insurers impose burdens on consumers, they may undermine any rights they have to refuse or reduce a claim. Under Clause 4.1b, an insurer is actually not entitled to a remedy unless they can show that a consumer's misrepresentation induces them to enter into the contract at all or on its current terms. As a result, the bill creates no benefit for insurers if they ask questions seeking answers they would not need to rely on. Furthermore, under Clause 3, a long and complicated questionnaire may have a bearing on whether a consumer has taken a reasonable care not to make a misrepresentation. They are at greater risk of having to pay claims, despite not having been given the correct information, if they make things difficult for the consumer. So in my view, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no danger the bill will place extra burdens on consumers through these two measures, in addition to the market forces uh, we have already briefly discussed tonight. Our impact assessment, furthermore, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, does not expect that this bill will result in significant changes to the questions asked by insurers. This bill actually brings the statute in line, to, in line with existing best practice and regulation. I think it's fair to say we are updating the law, not altering the approach of insurers. So I do not believe, in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't believe it would be beneficial for this to be able to go further than it already does, uh, to seek to change practice by prescribing the content and the number of insurers' questions. I think if we were to try to do that, to prescribe or limit the information insurers are able to seek, then it, it may be that we would even increase premiums. And you take, for example, the uh, recent um, ECJ ruling, which actually one honourable member has already referred to tonight, on the use of gender in insurance pricing, which by limiting the risk factors uh, that insurers can use, will actually increase the average cost of insurance. So creating a duty uh, for insurers in primary legislation, I think, would uh, not be the appropriate solution. Again, Mr Deputy Speaker, we continue to work very closely with the insurance industry on this point and, on consumer, and with consumers groups on a range of issues. 
where there are specific uh, concerns about practice in certain parts of the market, government has worked with the industry on guidance. Accepting this amendment, therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, and creating a provision here is unnecessary. It will throw out, I think, the careful balance in the bill, and I don't think it is the most effective way to make sure that consumers don't face excessive burdens. I would therefore ask the Honourable Member to withdraw his amendment. Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I hear what the Minister says. I don't agree with her that um, she needed to sort of dig through the barrel of uh, uh, reasons to resist amendments. I know that official, officials tend to list a number of a number of uh, reasons, usually, typically, it's sort of drafting deficiencies or, or others, but, but in, you know, it, it, upsetting the balance of the bill as a whole simply to place a duty on insurers to show regard to a principle about uh, a burden or a restriction being Im imposed being proportionate to the benefits uh, concerned. I, I don't think, uh, I think she might be going a little bit too far there. But the point of the amendment was to test, uh, test this particular issue. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that we won't find circumstances where a certain category of consumer, when faced with the, the greater degree of spe specific questions uh, in respect of the disclosure of their particulars uh, in an insurance contract, might not be deterred. In a sense, it links back to that earlier new clause we tabled before, and uh, maybe that would have been a better way to uh, relate to this particular uh, amendment. I want to kind of have a sense, uh, you know, a year, two years hence, how many people uh, might uh, be deterred from uh, taking out an insurance contract because of the particular administrative burden we're, we're discussing. But um, I've had an opportunity to air the particular point. I think uh, the Minister has uh, done her best to, uh, uh, to address it. Um, as I say, I don't wish to in any way denigrate the contents of the bill, which does have broad support, it is a very positive measure. I think it's an important uh, uh, set of changes, and so I'd be happy to withdraw uh, this particular amendment at this, this time. But we will want to keep a close eye on how this situation develops. Too good to so that amendment one be withdrawn. Oh. Amendment one withdrawn. Consideration completed. Third reading. What day? No. Chloe Smith. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Point of order for the chair. Okay, it's, now, it's now gone eight o'clock. Um, by an act of indulgence, a number of us allowed the uh, government to uh, remove the normal constraints on private, bus private business so that the three hours could continue to uh, start later than seven o'clock. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, with the prospect of uh, quite a, a, a reasonable debate in length on, on third reading, that it would be open to the government uh, to um, adjourn the third reading to another day, so that uh, the three hours which are set aside for the private bill uh, could, business could, could continue now. Certainly not a, a matter for the chair to intervene. That is uh, a consideration for the government business managers. Chloe Smith. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I shall uh, certainly do my, uh, do my bit in attempting to be brief uh, but comprehensive in begging to move that the bill be now read the third time. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think that both sides, in fact all sides of the House, can agree that the current law relating to pre-contractual disclosure and representation in connection with consumer insurance contracts is unreasonable. And I think we can all agree that the alternative practices favoured by regulators and insurers, although not always consistent, give the consumer far better protection from having claims unreasonably refused. This bill updates the law to reflect what has quite rightly become market practice. In doing so, it provides clarity for consumers of their duties and how they can expect to be treated by insurers. On behalf of uh, the Financial Secretary who began uh, uh, this process for the Government, I'd certainly like to thank all those members who have made contributions during consideration of this bill and who have without exception been able to recognise that this is a valuable and much needed update to the statute. We also owe thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker, to the Law Commissions whose joint report on the issue and extensive work has produced a bill which implements this change with the backing of a wide range of consumer groups as well as the industry and regulators. 
The drafters of the Marine Insurance Act 1906, if they may still be around with us, will not have envisaged the current ways in which consumers purchase insurance cover for things including their homes, their cars, their health and their llamas. They will also not have imagined the comparison website and the way it requests information from consumers. In October 2010, a letter with a range of signatories was sent to the Times in support of this bill. It described the current law as designed to govern face-to-face -face commercial insurance deals in the coffee houses of Georgia and London. This act, excuse me, that act is not suitable to the modern uh, insurance market, especially as it does also contain harsh penalties for reasonable failures to disclose or accurately represent information when purchasing insurance. So this bill replaces the current burdens and duty that the consumer would provide all information that might influence the judgment of a prudent insurer. Instead, they must take reasonable care to answer the insurer's clear and specific questions. This bill will also mean that penalties for non-disclosure or misrepresentation are proportionate rather than allowing the insurer to legally void the contract in all cases. Consumers have been protected by the Financial Ombudsman Service, which has been applying these proportionate remedies for some time, as well as market practice and FSA rules. But there are real benefits in aligning the law with this practice. In some circumstances, Mr Deputy Speaker, the different legal and regulatory positions cause problems for both industry and consumers. At present, the FOS receives around 1,000 complaints a year about non-disclosure and misrepresentation. Around half the insurer's uh, decisions are upheld, a figure which we would expect to be much higher if there was sufficient clarity around the rules. This indicates that insurers find it difficult to locate and interpret the, different, the, the relevant rules. Mr Deputy Speaker, we believe that the two key provisions which I've just set out, the change in the duty of the consumer and the provision of a proportionate rather than harsh set of remedies for the insurer, shift the balance of the law in favour of the consumer. The Marine Insurance Act is in some parts heavily biased in favour of insurers and this attempts to rectify that bias. The bill takes a high level of approach. I shall. Has uh, she or her department produce any estimate of the reduction in the burden on the Financial Ombudsman Service, which she expects to come as a result of this bill? Uh, some estimates have been made of that figure, uh, and, and, I, and I believe he'll find uh, some of them in the impact assessment, uh, but uh, I'm sure my honourable a uh, friend, the Financial Secretary, would be happy to take up that point in further detail uh, if required on top of that. This bill in front of us today, I should, I should really point out, does take a rather high-level approach which updates the principles set out in law to bring these in line with good practice rather than attempting to set out prescriptive detail. This should help avoid being, uh, the, the law becoming outdated again as market practice develops. I do hope that members today will accept the advice of those consumer representatives who wrote to the Bill Committee, including Age UK, the British Heart Foundation, Consumer Focus, Macmillan Cancer Support, the Trading Standard Institute, which and unlock to accept this legislation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question will be read the third time. Mr Christopher Leslie. Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the Minister for her uh, comments uh, in respect of the third reading of this bill. I would also like to join her in welcoming the legislation. It was something that was prompted by the Law Commission report uh, from those uh, uh, days when we had a, a Labour administration back in 2009. The Law Commission made these recommendations and I'm glad that the um, government saw fit to take these issues forward and bring the legislation before the House today. And these are, uh, as I was saying before, incredibly important uh, uh, changes. Um, putting uh, beyond doubt some of the more opaque uh, and obscure elements of common law and, and uh, voluntary codes into a more statutory form, first of all to update the law in relation to pre-contractual disclosure, but also to clarify uh, the rules about misrepresentations, the uh, distinction between consumers who perhaps, perhaps uh, unknowingly uh, misrepresent their circumstances and those who um, are, are um, knowingly misleading an insurer. 
and clarifying the legislation in this way is incredibly useful. Uh, we welcome it very much from, uh, from this side of the House. Um, there have been circumstances where um, insurers have uh, used the opacity of, of the uh, common law to, in a sense, uh, take advantage of, of uh, uh, those uh, consumers who might have wanted to make a claim but were then uh, found unable to do so because they didn't disclose a particular uh, aspect of their, of their lives to the insurer at the time the contract was taken out. And the particularly um, uh, insidious uh, nature of some of those uh, circumstances were where, for example, uh, victim, uh, persons who uh, developed cancer or multiple sc uh, sclerosis uh, were unable to uh, um, uh, have a payment made under a claim for insurance because you know, early symptoms uh, which they didn't know themselves uh, might generate, it might develop into a, a more serious long-term uh, condition. Uh, were, were pointed out by an insurer that, oh, well, they should have uh, talked about a tingle in their, in their feet or a, uh, another particular aspect of a, a medical circumstance that nobody would you know, think was the, was the beginning of a, of a, of a worse or, or more serious disease. But um, I'm glad that the bill is uh, closing some of those loopholes and uh, taking action. And we don't want consumers to get, have to have recourse solely to the Financial Ombudsman Service to gain redress. Uh, it, the rules as they stand were in, inadequate. Uh, we need the courts to be able to rely on clearer legal statute to clarify these arrangements, and this bill achieves those arrangements. It abolishes the consumer's duty to volunteer information in a, in a more general and non-specific way. It also clarifies arrangements for group insurance, uh, life insurance, and rules around uh, intermediaries, and so we think this is an important piece of legislation. I'm glad we've had the opportunity in, de in uh, the debate to touch on some of these important questions. The state of the motor insurance industry and why more action needs to be taken to help the consumers there. Those, uh, those subjects of flood insurance, and yes, I'll be happy to give way to my honourable friend. Thank you, honourable member, for giving way. Has the bill considered the, the differential in prices across the whole of the United Kingdom, in particular Northern Ireland, where we have the highest uh, uh, insurance premiums in the whole of the United Kingdom? What's higher in England? What's higher in Scotland? What's higher in, in Wales as well? And is it not time to have the same competition in Northern Ireland? Oh, oh, order, order. We are on third reading and it must be directed to the part of third reading. Christopher Lester. To, but to be fair, Mr Deputy yeah, Speaker, it was a, a very important point. There are uh, regional disparities in uh, consumer insurance and we did try and uh, seek uh, uh, through through an amendment uh, the, uh the experienced members should know that we we can't discuss what wasn't in the bill we're at third reading it is what is in the bill and i'm sure he's well aware of that as much as um, the chair is tempted to listen i think we've got to make progress christopher Lesley. mr speaker your strictures are uh, are very firm and uh, i wouldn't uh, indeed wouldn't in any way want to uh, uh, stray out of out of order, but suffice to say that this bill I hope will positively help all parts of the country and especially those regions where we need to ensure that insurance standards are to a high degree. And uh, the honourable gentleman makes an, an important point. I uh, it's a shame that the honourable member for Lichfield is is no longer with us in the, in the chamber. We were talking about pet insurance. Uh, I didn't realise he, he owned a llama. Uh, perhaps he's gone to groom his uh, llama uh, during the, uh, uh, during the, the, uh, uh, the hours in which uh, these things normally uh, take place. But these, these, are, these are important debates. I'm uh, grateful to honourable members for uh, discussing uh, the uh, serious issues that we have uh, to hand. We support the legislation. Uh, we do need to keep an eye on uh, the impact of that legislation, uh, but with those remarks, I'd like to support the third reading yeah, of, of yeah. this bill. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have no more mention of the member for Litchfield's llama. Jonathan Edwards. <laughs> Not from me, really, Mr. Oh. Um, may I 
may I um, just detain the House briefly in order to ensure that I place on record the, um, the contribution that has been made by the All Party Group on Insurance and Financial yeah, Services yeah, yeah. to this particular legislation. I do so as Chairman of that, uh, yeah. of that All Party Group. Uh, the group met, in fact, on the 1st of December 2010 at the request of the very consumer bodies that my honourable friend has referred to. And I'm glad that the Shadow Minister made reference to multiple sclerosis because the Multiple Sclerosis Society were one of the additional groups that made the request that we should examine the law in this area. And what we were told is that the law has in fact been under review since 1980, both in, in the 1980s and in the 1990s, the shortcomings in relation to the operation of consumer uh, law were apparent. A scoping paper was done in 2006, as has rightly been said by the honourable gentleman on the benches opposite. The Law Commission then produced their proposed legislation. But it was not enacted, despite the fact, actually, that in 2009 a request was made to the last Labour government to do so. And the reason was that it was, no, it's no party point. The reason was that the Association of British Insurers had responded, but had expressed their broad support for the recommendations, but saying in a letter that there were still issues that needed to be addressed before the bill could enter the process of uncontroversial bills. And it's that that is the context of the all-party group's contribution. Because we had our meeting on the 1st of December. We heard from Mr David Herzl, the Law Commissioner, who is the author of this legislation. He also went to the special public bill committee that was set up as part of this uh, process. Uh, and we also heard from Mr Peter Tildesley, who is a senior lecturer in insurance law at the University of Bedfordshire and a consultant to the Financial Ombudsman Service and a, and a lawyer at the Law Commission as well. Uh, and both of them uh, directed us to the fact that there was a need to have the buy-in of the Association of British Insurers before we were able to make use of the uncontroversial bills process. And what's important is this is the only occasion I've been able, Mr Deputy Speaker, to refer to this because it is the first bill that has gone through this new Law Commission process. That's meant there was no second reading on the floor here. Uh, there was a 29-minute session in committee uh, upstairs and there was similarly in the Lords this special public bill committee as well. So that's because the legislation is uncontroversial. I'm delighted to say that when we had our meeting with David Herzl and with Peter Tildesley from the University of Bedfordshire, we contacted the Association of British Insurers and they came back within three days to clarify that their letter had been misinterpreted and that as far as they were concerned, the legislation could proceed on this basis and within a few weeks that's what happened. So I do say in the context of the review that is taking place of all party groups in this House, here is a contribution I believe that an all party group has made which has been constructive and I pay credit to my colleagues on the all party group for the contribution that they have made to this excellent legislation. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I think this, uh, this, this merits the, the briefest of comments to, to thank uh, yeah. honourable members for their comments uh, in the third reading section of today, uh, on top of those throughout the progress of this bill. I think this is a long overdue update to the law. I'm pleased we can all recognise, indeed, in this place and outside of this place, has just been eloquently set out, the value it brings for customers as well as the industry. I think uh, the, the only final additional point to make is that it's, uh, it's clearly right that our regulators have adopted an approach more reasonable than that set out by the current law, but we need clarity and consistency between regulators and the courts, which this bill provides. I, um, I, uh, I commend this bill... Uh, to the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and I hope it will be welcomed elsewhere as it has been here tonight. Yeah. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. As many of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no.
I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it.